Good evening, everyone. I'm Craig Calhoun, the director of the London School of Economics and Political Science, and it's a pleasure to welcome you and to welcome Stephen Hester to the LSE. Stephen Hester was appointed the group chief, chief executive of RBS Group on 21st November 2008. I'm sure that day is clear in his mind. After the UK government was forced to rescue the bank from the brink of collapse during the financial crisis. He was previously chief executive of the British Land Company, chief operating officer of Abbey National, and prior to that held positions with Credit Suisse, First Boston, including chief financial officer, head of fixed income and co-head of European investment banking. In 2008, he served as a non-executive director of Northern Rock PLC. I think he'll tell you a bit about his path into his current position. For those Twitter users in the audience, the hashtag for today's event is hash sign LSERBS. As usual after the lecture, there will be a chance for you to put your questions to Mr. Hester. But now will you please join me in welcoming Stephen Hester to deliver his lecture on rebuilding banking. Great, thank you very much for that uh, introduction and, and everyone for your, uh, for your welcome. I have to apologize in advance as you might hear my uh, voice threatening to give out. Um, I sort of thought, though, if I, if I uh, end up doing the rest of it in sign language, it gives an easy uh, headline about actions rather than words, which I know bankers uh, are supposed to be uh, doing more of. But uh, let's see how it goes. Uh, of course, I'm really pleased to be here at the LSE. It's, uh, you know, it's something that uh, not only is a world-renowned institution, uh, but I think in the whole topic of uh, economic and social literacy and, um, and of course, developing... Uh, young talent is absolutely essentially where we want to be in, and in all of our interests to, um, uh, 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 to encourage. But tonight, uh, what I was going to uh, do is to try to speak relatively candidly um, about the job of uh, recovering a failed global bank and, of course, about the, the ongoing transformation of the banking sector uh, in which uh, our bank sits. Uh, and uh, as all of you will recognise and indeed uh, tell me, our work at RBS and indeed the broader reform agenda uh, is far from complete. Uh, and so uh, I'm here uh, not only to speak uh, but also uh, to listen uh, and I hope that we do have a, a good uh, set of questions and uh, an engagement afterwards. I've had, as was, uh, as was mentioned in the introduction, both an insider's and an outsider's uh, view of the banking crisis and of its causes, uh, having uh, been in the immediate years before the crisis operating outside uh, the banking sector and then, of course, uh, coming back in initially uh, as non-executive uh, after nationalisation of, of Northern Rock and then, of course, uh, uh, parachuted into RBS. Uh, and uh, sadly, uh, but as we know, uh, the bank RBS is, uh, I guess, sort of a British poster child for what went wrong in banking. Uh, and to fix it, uh, we're engaged uh, probably in the largest uh, and one of the most complex uh, corporate restructurings uh, ever. And certainly on the eve of its financial collapse in 2008, RBS had a balance sheet roughly the size of the entire UK economy, £1.6 trillion. Pounds. Over 30 million customers relied on us, uh, and uh, yet this, this large and, and I think vital institution uh, was resting on a wafer-thin uh, capital base and had effectively uh, run out of money uh, to fund itself and uh, to fund our customers. And so, as we all know, uh, RBS, along with plenty of other banks, uh, was uh, nationalised or was part nationalised, relied on uh, state support, uh, and uh, the consequences uh, of uh, that not happening uh, were ones that, of course, right around the world, uh, it is now public policy and desirable, even were it not public policy, to avoid. And, and tonight's talk is not about if you like, the, uh, uh, the avoiding of the systemic repeat, uh, but suffice to say uh, that is crucial, it's proceeding well, uh, and I believe that we are already uh, in economies around the world on a path uh, that would avoid governments having to put their hands in their pockets uh, in the same way uh, again. 
Now, I was uh, recruited to re recover the bank's fortunes uh, for all of uh, the people who rely on us. And uh, while, of course, that meant restructuring the balance sheet and risk profile, uh, it also meant changing the culture that, that had created that balance sheet and, crucially, ensuring that customer service uh, was maintained and, over time, improved. Uh, and, of course, uh, there's also uh, the small matter in our goals of the, uh, of the £45 billion pounds of taxpayers' investment, uh, and one of the things that we must also do is to make sure that RBS uh, becomes worth that and more again in the future so taxpayers can get the money back uh, and put it to work on uh, things that perhaps uh, matter more into the future. And so along with, I guess, 140, 150,000 colleagues, we are trying to build a really good bank. And I believe that the best way to do this is to create a really good company. And that's a theme that I want to uh, expand upon uh, during my remarks this evening. And indeed, when I first came into banking, I guess in the, uh, in the early 1980s, my, my early career uh, was as an advisor to other companies, not, not banks, uh, but other companies in general. And, and during that period, I began to think, I hope deeply, about what it is uh, that makes companies succeed. Uh, and I think that we... Uh, can uh, make an, an argument that the definition of corporate success uh, in the years that have ensued uh, uh, perhaps became dangerously narrowed. And to paraphrase Milton Friedman, the social responsibility of a company was to increase its profits. And that became the prevailing view. Critics would argue it remained that way for banks right up until the crash. Uh, and in my view, the evidence points to a different and more balanced conclusion now uh, and I'll explain uh, more as I go through. Uh, and, of course, uh, in this process, I have given uh, a lot of thought to whether or not banks uh, can be thought of in the same way as other companies. Uh, we have very similar issues uh, to other companies in most respects, uh, but they're also different. Banks are also different in the way uh, that they're funded, in the way that they're geared to the economies they serve. Uh, and as a result of that financial prudence, uh, safety and soundness are important to a bank and to society in a way that was not well calibrated prior to the crisis by banks or, or actually by managers of our major economies. Uh, and uh, it's in this area, this calibration, that I think the banking sector has made the most progress. Uh, but in exploring uh, these themes, I'll talk about how uh, we tried, uh, how we are trying uh, to uh, restore the battered reputation of the banking industry, and in particular, of course, the topic, uh, I suppose, of the hour on, on how to address, how to fix the culture of banks. Uh, but I don't plan to offer up a 20-point plan uh, of change to fix uh, the culture at RBS, because I actually think that in um, business, enduring cultural change, a bit like uh, the desire to obtain a higher share price, is rarely best achieved when it is the primary goal. My view for debate this evening is that if you create a really good company, then you will get a really good culture. And the process of getting it right uh, is the product of a slow, deliberate and sustained march through a series of small things, many of them just basic management disciplines. Uh, and it's easy to say that a bank like RBS exists to put customers at the heart of everything we do. I, I know it's easy to say because I, I say it myself all the time. But it takes a long time. Uh, and there are many changes and improvements to both attain and sustain. And I'll talk about some of them uh, as we go through also. Because banking matters. Uh, and while it's uh, fair to say that societies have long been wary of financiers, the current level of negative feeling is, in my view, uh, particularly unhealthy. And we need to uh, try to reach a new compact with society where banks are better at balancing the interests of everyone who depends upon them. And only then, uh, I think, can we expect some acceptance of the difficult trade-offs uh, that banks face in reconciling uh, what are often competing interests. Uh, as we know, banking has been at the forefront of economic and public policy debates, at least since 2008, blamed for the crisis, fingered now uh, for holding back economic recovery uh, and back in the dock uh, also uh, today for a wide range of cultural failings. And as a result, the pendulum of regulation and public attitudes has swung dramatically and banks uh, are 
changing substantially of their own volition and under unyielding public pressure. Uh, and that pressure is, of course, focused most in those countries where economic problems have been greatest. Uh, and when complete, uh, I believe that banks will still play a central role in modern economies. But every bank, and indeed those who regulate them, uh, will need to have answered some basic questions about their institutions. Uh, is it safe and sound? Can it recover in future crises without government capital? Are customers and society served well? And can it satisfy the requirements of its shareholders? Uh, and since uh, I came back into the banking sector in uh, late 2008, I've said many times that banks can only be as sound as the economies in which they operate, and they can only be as successful as their customers. And it's rare to find strong banks in weak economies and vice versa. Banks are geared to their economies, which bestows them, of course, with an extra responsibility to be safe and sound, but also means that they rely a lot on policymakers to ensure economic health and stability. Banks are a messenger of good and bad economic management, as well as principles themselves. Uh, but, of course, as we, uh, as we all know, uh, where we stand today, the banking industry, a few years post uh, the crisis hit, uh, feels uncomfortable, to say the least. Uh, the critics uh, claim uh, that our industry cannot get things right, uh, and uh, perhaps more worrying uh, that very little progress uh, is uh, being made. Uh, I think that the impression of little progress is wrong, but I can, of course, completely understand the public sentiment. And uh, uh, my industry is currently uh, revealing perhaps uh, the last vestiges, I hope the last vestiges, of its era of overreach through issues such as LIBOR and PPI. Uh, and inevitably, those scandals are bound to dominate public perception. Uh, and I guess uh, the reality is that they represent uh, the bill for damages rendered, and dealing with them openly and directly is clearly necessary to enable the industry to move forward. Uh, but the impression that banks have not made progress in restoring safety and soundness is wrong. We have to remind ourselves, of course, just four years ago, um, uh, people were worrying about the cash machines at RBS running dry throughout 2009, global financial markets were riddled with paranoia and panic uh, and uh, concerns about hidden uh, troubles could send the most respected institution shares uh, tumbling. Uh, and the question of trust was not, will banks do the right thing? Instead it was, will they keep my money safe? And today those issues are still being confronted in some Eurozone countries. Their issue is still safety. In the UK, we are increasingly able to move on to other difficult topics in banking as safety and soundness have vastly improved. And we can look at RBS for evidence uh, of how far we've come. When we uh, set out the recovery path for RBS, there were three priorities around which everything else uh, has been built and which guide each step of our journey. Uh, we need to serve customers well and better. We need to be safe and sound for all who rely on us, uh, and of course, uh, out of those uh, two goals, we need to fashion a valuable bank for shareholders uh, and uh, to protect the £45 billion taxpayers have invested uh, and I submit cannot afford to write off. So during the last three years, we've tried to answer, if you like, the existential challenge first and restructure the bank to safety and soundness. Uh, but we have also worked to sustain customer service during that challenge, uh, whilst also laying foundations throughout the business for doing a better job and becoming a better bank. And even in our most difficult moment, we began, just began, but began to restore customer service to the heart of our thinking. Uh, for example, that's why uh, some of our very early actions were around lengthening grace periods for people struggling uh, with mortgage repayments, uh, guaranteeing price and availability of overdraft funding for our small business uh, uh, clients. But we knew that these kind of actions would count for little if we didn't also put the bank on a firmer financial footing. Uh, and so I think these things are uh, increasingly well known. Uh, at RBS, uh, in the last three and a half years, we've reduced the size of our balance sheet by 
some £700 billion, more than has been achieved in any other bank, actually, uh, bank or government, uh, and with huge streamlining of scale and scope. And at the same time, we have actually increased our lending uh, to our core UK retail and commercial customers. The customers who we know are also our future. And we've increased capital ratios from 4% to over 10%. Um, we've implemented a huge reduction in the balance sheet and a huge increase in the capital that sits on it. We've dramatically reduced dependency on wholesale funding markets and achieved already uh, what I've described as the gold standard of banking by taking as much through customer deposits as we make in loans. I'll come on to cultural change in a moment, but it's worth mentioning here that changing our funding structure is more than just metrics and numbers. It could only be achieved by changing the mindset of our bankers uh, and having them think about customer relationships in a more sustainable way. And of course, uh, along uh, this route, there have been massive reductions in the support needed from government. All of our emergency liquidity support, well over £100 billion, has been repaid. £300 billion of so-called toxic uh, credit uh, insurance, uh, a scheme called uh, the Asset Protection Scheme, is coming up to its first potential exit point with no claim having been made and, uh, in my view, no need for the insurance to continue. The UK is better off and safer for these changes happening, although I accept completely that none of that support should have ever been needed had RBS uh, been a really good company in the first place. And we have about 15 months of heavy lifting still to do to essentially complete the restructuring phase at RBS and to make good on the promises made in our five-year plan. Uh, we're out of the mire, uh, but not yet out of the woods, because we still depend on the health of the economies we serve today, which, of course, uh, we all know uh, face challenges. Uh, but we face today's challenges with a financial strength that many people would have thought inconceivable just three and a half years ago when we launched our plan. Now, the job of leading RBS through this process, I guess, has brought home uh, to me in a, in a profound way that the role of any CEO involves balancing the interests of the many people who depend upon a company. And when those interests are competing, whether they're for, for time or resource, a judgment call is recalled, re re required. Uh, and while, of course, it's not the way uh, to win popularity contests, uh, one hopes this will be met with understanding uh, in most quarters. Uh, and looking back uh, in uh, recent years to our journey, we made faith in the basic solvency of the bank priority number one. We thought that was the best thing we could do for our customers our shelves, our employees, the, the communities we operated in. But it was emphatically not our only priority, and much has been and is being done to make progress on the other fronts. Uh, so uh, with that, let me then turn uh, to uh, one of the vital questions, if you like, that I described uh, banks as needing to answer, namely whether we are indeed serving our customers and society well. Uh, and clearly, it's possible to look at the many scandals that have hit banking in recent years and see them as individual episodes of bad judgment or wrong behaviours. In fact, I think it's more accurate to say that most of them uh, can be actually conjoined, seen together, uh, perhaps as related to one big scandal, uh, and that is simply that banks have not been good enough servants of their customers in the recent past. The banking industry in the decade preceding the crisis was focused on income. It expanded too fast. It prioritised sales over service and failed to properly balance the interests of its customers and shareholders uh, with those of its managers. Hubris set in. Uh, too much of the ethos became selfish, personally and institutionally. Uh, and, of course, market economies rely on self-interest as a key mechanism uh, but it, it works best uh, where enlightened or sustainable self-interest is what's pursued. Uh, and, and I submit to you there is a basic truth about what makes a good company. Really good companies perform well for their owners, their employees and communities, if above all else they serve their customers well. And you can have a number of different goals for your company, 
But at the core, great businesses are driven by their customers' priorities, by their customers' values and goals and needs, and not by their own. I'll give you a, an, an unrelated uh, example in another industry which, uh, which I've thought about. And anyone who uh, shops regularly in supermarkets here, I think, can't fail to have noticed the transformation in service in the last 20 years. And if you ask any member of, serve, of staff in a supermarket, stacking the shelves, whatever they're doing, uh, for often the most obscure item, they will stop what they're doing and take you immediately to that item, wherever it may be in the supermarket. Banks have not kept the same pace uh, in either service or product evolution. But uh, I should be clear, I want to be clear, that at RBS the vast majority of our staff are focused very squarely on doing a good job for customers. Uh, and it's also uh, clear to me uh, that what we need to do is to reinforce those instinct, instincts and nourish the very real care for customers that exists uh, with our people. And we have to do more uh, to make sure everyone who works in our bank walks through the door every day uh, with the customer completely front of mind. Banks need to unambiguously recognise uh, that uh, the purpose is to serve customers well. And to serve them well, of course, in the context of their broader communities with the range of impacts that banks as a huge industry have on society, both culturally and economically. Uh, but the point I'm making is that we must do more than just treat symptoms. We can't afford to just fix LIBOR or just fix money laundering controls or just fix the way we market our products. We need to address the root cause of the industry's failings uh, and that, as I have said, uh, is very clearly the need for better focus on serving the customer well and building that into our collective cultural DNA. I think that is the route uh, through many of the cultural failings associated with banks today. Uh, now, let me um, perhaps uh, deal with uh, or address in some way uh, perhaps the silent criticisms that may be in the room about words versus actions. Uh, and I want to address my own argument that change uh, in the area we're talking about is achieved by doing many things over many years. Uh, since 2009, I believe RBS has already made progress in becoming more customer-focused. Uh, and I think that the changes we've made will have increasing visibility as they bed in. Because improving support for customers uh, was the top goal of our strategic plan since 2009. Uh, and uh, right across all of our businesses, the service offerings have been overhauled to be explicitly customer-driven in their aim. Uh, we, uh, of course, have undertaken huge reform in the way we evaluate risks and strategies so that our ability to be there for customers in the future uh, cannot be questioned in the way that it has been in the recent past. We've reformed um, the way we pay our staff uh, so that customer satisfaction and risk control, rather than just profit, uh, determine whether or not you get a bonus, how big that bonus may be. Uh, and I certainly take to heart uh, the sentiment that we should pay people to serve well, not simply to sell well. Throughout our business, we've instituted customer and reputational filters and controls that seek to examine what products and what services we provide to customers through the lens of sustainability, transparency and fairness. In our investment bank, we've pulled out of many markets and businesses that were not well connected to the priorities of our large corporate and institutional customers. Uh, and, as I said before, even as we undertook the largest corporate restructuring in history with massive cuts to our balance sheet, we've grown our support uh, for core UK corporate and retail customers. But the second thing I should say about the criticism of talk over action uh, is uh, that I also agree with that criticism. There's no question that we have to do more. Uh, we need to make sure that what we have done translates into results as well. And the changes I just outlined have been important, but much of it has focused on consolidating the existing cultural strengths present in our bank and taking care of, I don't know, what you might call hygiene uh, issues in areas of weakness. And certainly, if banks hope to ever be considered great companies again, the work to strengthen our customer culture has to be demanding and stretching and continuous. 
some things that we will be, uh, if you like, adding to, improving on RBS's agenda uh, that, we're, uh, that are underway uh, as we speak uh, is extending uh, explicit customer charters across all of our businesses, setting expectations and offering transparency and motivation on how we do against them. We began this uh, in our retail bank um, uh, and we're going to extend it uh, across our business and make them more demanding at the same time. And in our business banking area here in the UK, we've piloted a training and accreditation program for all of our frontline bankers to ensure they are better equipped to serve our customers. Banking is a profession and we need to take the professional training of our people seriously. Uh, and the work that we've already piloted in the business bank uh, with encouraging results uh, has led us to uh, now establish a program in our wealth management business coots uh, and we will do much more right throughout our bank in this area. And there are many other things uh, that we're doing that I could highlight here, but we will still need to strike a balance between all the relevant interests in the company. And we know that difficult and ambiguous challenges require actions which can never please all interests at the same time. <coughs> Serving customers and society well sometimes means saying no to things that our customers want. And all businesses have complex service and pricing trade-offs between customers and across products. <coughs> Excuse me. Our ability to fulfil customer needs and our role in society also requires us to have good people. Uh, but what I am saying is that I see no way in which a bank can become a really good company without having a customer's interest at the heart of its values. And of course, uh, mention of values brings me back to the, the current public focus on the culture of banking. And given what I said uh, earlier on, <coughs> It ill behoves me uh, to talk about what we must do now to fix culture. Uh, and uh, as I've said, to summarise my position so far, I think that a really good bank must be safe and sound, must put serving customers well at the heart of its thinking. And all the things needed to make that a reality will, in their own way, build towards a culture that sees everyone in the bank striving to do the right thing at the right time and for the right reasons. Uh, I do think we should accept that there is something bleak about cultural change. But it is very important, that said, uh, to include in the lists of things to do measures which clarify what doing the right thing means and ensure that areas as important as conduct and ethics, uh, if you like, are turned into a regular fitness program for our employees. And it's clearly not enough uh, to draft codes of conduct and stick them on internet sites. Uh, so certainly at RBS, we're reviewing our code uh, to make sure that it reflects the ethos I've outlined tonight, but most importantly, uh, that we can bring it to life with our people in the years ahead. And we spent a lot of time, as I mentioned before, reforming the way we pay and incentivize our staff. But it is fair to say that uh, our focus initially <coughs> was on reforming pay so that it better balanced, uh, or at least was targeted to better balance, the employee and shareholder interest using shares, using clawbacks, deferral and so on. Our reform agenda on pay has to go further so that it also takes uh, full and proper account of customer interest. And that means pay awards being reflective of customer service, uh, not just sales. Uh, and we also uh, will be making governance changes at the board level uh, to reinforce active and transparent board oversight of our customer community and employee issues. If we get the next phase of our recovery plan right and succeed in balancing the interests of customers with others in a fair way, I think we will be well advanced in our new compact with society. So uh, I guess wrapping up, certainly one of the things I've had to adjust to in the last four years is the huge amount of public interest in what we do uh, and how we do it. Of course, any CEO expects to be in dialogue with their customers and investors. What's now clear in, uh, in my job, uh, that I as CEO and RBS uh, as a bank also need to be in dialogue with broader society. The public have higher demands of us in the reform agenda than perhaps some other banks. 
and it's taken a while to get used to that, but we've come to realise the almost unique accountability it brings uh, is born of a public desire for a different RBS to emerge. We've tried to lead the way by being more open in our public disclosures, by being more accessible in our communication style. Uh, in the early years, as we've discussed, uh, we focused on restoring safety and soundness to RBS. Uh, we saw this as the best thing we could do for the country. But the dialogue with the public is as intense as ever, and the relief uh, that RBS is out of intensive care has given way quickly to a conversation about what sort of bank we will become. Are we on the side of our customers, and are we going to keep changing and reforming until people believe we can make a positive difference to their lives and the prosperity of the country? And the answer to all of those questions is yes, we will try to. And so uh, banks took Friedman's instruction to make money more literally than I'm sure he would ever have intended. The consequences were bad all around. The role of good companies and good banks extends beyond the narrow pursuit of profit. <coughs> what I would like to achieve with RBS uh, perhaps accords more closely with an economist who is still around and entertaining us with his FT column. Uh, in a lecture like this given in uh, 1998, John Kay described successful companies as organisations which serve the needs of their customers, provide a rewarding environment for those who work for them, which satisfy the requirements of those who finance them and support the development of the communities in which they operate. Uh, in the last four years, I've come to understand uh, the wisdom of that description. There are 140,000 people at RBS trying to make this the reality of our recovery plan. And to do it well, we must every day seek to understand the interests of all those who depend on our company, to understand the trade-offs we must make to try and get the judgment calls uh, right uh, if we are to be a successful business again. When a company is recovering from the edge of insolvency, those trade-offs can be acute, but that's why we have companies in our society. That is what they're expected to do. And I'm confident that we can build on our progress to this point. A strong, safe balance sheet combined with a culture that puts customer service at the center of our thinking makes for a really good bank. It is also what will help us win back the thing that our industry rests on and cannot succeed without, and that's trust. Thank you very much. Stephen, thank you for your speech, and I say that as one of your retail banking customers. I should say to our audience that Stephen Hester is the son of a university professor, and I think although he is not an academic by career, you will agree that he shares a thoughtful, analytic approach to understanding and addressing important issues. And there are very few more important issues than rebuilding banking today. I won't try to recap all of Stephen's speech for you. There are a series of key themes that he returned to repeatedly. He thinks of a bank, not just in terms of finance, but as a company. He thinks of restructuring as a matter of core management disciplines and of cultural change. He wants to put customers first, and indeed says failure to attend to customer service is the root cause of basic failures in banking but recognizes a full range of stakeholders, and especially in the current context of public responsibility. He acknowledges public discontent, but he thinks banks have made considerable progress in establishing the operational basis for greater public and customer trust. He points out that RBS has repaid its state support and that it is quickly emerging from any need for special insurance, but he reminds us that banking and the larger economy depend closely on each other. Reforming internal practices at RBS, he hopes for a broader social dialogue and new social compact. Stephen referred in the talk to silent criticisms he thought might be in the room. Since this is the LSE, I trust they will not remain silent long. <laughs> we now open the floor to questions but let me call on you to stick to asking questions 
rather than making speeches of your own. Please let us know your name and affiliation and wait for the steward with the roving microphone to get to you. First, right here on the aisle. Um, Ian Stewart uh, from, from Deloitte. I, I think both um, Paul Volcker and Adair Turner have um, uh, cast some doubt on the value of financial innovation in general in, in the last sort of 20 years. I think um, Volcker suggested the only useful thing um, that's come out of financial innovation is the, uh, the cash machine. It seems a bit harsh. Um, but I just wonder in this, this, this world, this, this kind of lower risk, more regulated, more utility-like world where banks focus on um, their, their core customers and you know, households and, and, and corporates, um, is there going to be any role for financial innovation at RBS? And if there isn't, are you going to be able to offer the kind of returns which um, capital markets will want from, from a bank? Well, thank you for that, uh, for that uh, question. I suppose the parallel that, uh, that I would draw um, is to many other uh, technologies. Uh, and <coughs> to observe that, if you like, right around our world uh, today, um, uh, the issue is less is a technological advancement uh, capable of uh, enriching our world, being positive, uh, it's more sometimes that they're put to the wrong use. Uh, and uh, so uh, I think that it is most unlikely that advances in finance, in the same way as advances in any other walk of life, are things that we don't want anymore uh, or that the world uh, isn't going to produce. And indeed, one of the, I think, uh, most uh, important reasons why finance is such a big debate is the world needs it. And if the world is to move forward, finance has still got to move forward with it and help that. Uh, and so uh, in that sense, I think that our focus should be on moving finance forward in support of moving the world forward. But we need greater care in what use our technologies are being put to. And, and that's, I think, the way uh, that I would try to approach the question. Front row center. <coughs> to, to, to John Daniels and LNC, one of the most important questions in the post-financial crisis reform process is the scope of banking and whether banks should be split up into utility banks or casino banks, to quote John Kay, or to follow perhaps the independent commission of banking. This is a slightly narrower view on that. Do you have any views on the scope of banking generally? Well, I suppose um, I think that there is room for perfectly legitimate different opinions on the scope of banking or indeed any other industry and for different shapes and sizes and types uh, to all be deployed uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, trying to service customer needs and also the other needs of society. Uh, I think two of the things <coughs> that I would particularly focus on, though, that perhaps are opposite to the points that I was making tonight. Uh, the first is uh, to avoid banks, if they were to get into trouble in the future, calling on government money. Uh, and I think we've obviously seen all around the world um, uh, banks uh, that have had to do that. Uh, and we've certainly seen that the shape of the bank or the size of the bank was not a determinant on whether it got into trouble and needed government money. So my own view is the bit of reforms that focuses on so-called bail-in of debt, uh, which uh, put in normal company terms is a debt for equity swap uh, that could be managed in a fast chapter 11. That's how I would describe it. I think that is far more important to get right uh, and to institute uh, than, uh, if you like, the dividing lines between different kinds of banking. And the second thing I would say, which is, of course, central to tonight's discussion, uh, is that the um, demands on banking uh, and the areas that banking has fallen short have not respected the barriers between different kinds of banking. Uh, there are cultural and customer improvements across all kinds of banking uh, that we should be seeking. Uh, and so, again, as we prioritize how to uh, improve banking and the way it serves our society, uh, I think that would be areas that I would put particular emphasis on, uh, whilst, of course, acknowledging that we, along with all other banks, will, will change in whatever way the regulators make us change. Okay, the black and green right there. Yeah. Um, Rachel Chang, um, LSE. Um, you said 
in order to in order to change the banking culture, um, this requires um, little things done over a long period of time. Could you give us a few examples as to what these little things would be? Well, I mean, th there are. I mean, there are there are quite literally thousands. Uh, but let me just pick a couple of small examples that I use, uh, and, and forgive me for personalising. Um, I almost never, when I have business reviews with the people who are my, if you like, immediately run my businesses, I almost never talk about their quarterly profits. The contents of my meetings with them is much more about what's going on in the business, uh, how we're adapting the environment around us, how we're serving customers. Uh, and when I spend time, I spend the majority of my time either with customers or with our own people. Uh, so. In my own small ways, I'm trying to set an example of where I think priorities should be. Uh, now, that's only if you have the basic structure right, if you, if you obviously believe that your strategy is correct and that the framework you're operating is, incor is correct, uh, because all the restructuring we've done in financial terms was necessary to the safety and, and soundness agenda. But, but right across uh, the way people spend their time, uh, the measures uh, that you're communicating are important to them, uh, the facilitation of those measures. So again, you know, one thing we did, uh, which which um, I wish we'd done more of, uh, but we doubled the IT spending in RBS um, <coughs> two years ago, because I think that is one of the crucial tools uh, that we all need to serve customers better. Okay. There's the gentleman in red behind you. Joachim Harms, LSE. Um, my question is not directly in your field, but it comes into your field. Uh, if you I think you need to speak up a little bit. My question is not directly in, in your field, but it comes to your field if you speak about reshaping um, RBS. How do you um, recruit and maintain talented employees? Because I would think it's extremely difficult from your position, which you are in right now, to, um, to maintain and recruit these people because A, if you would decide to recruit them by using financial incentives, you're in the public focus once again. And uh, B, I would imagine that people who joined RBS years ago joined him for joined a different company than it is today. So what can you do to come to change this position of inferiority, um, especially compared to your UK competitors such as HSBC or Netflix? <coughs> thank you. Uh, well, thank you for that, that question, which is, which is, of course, an important and, and, and thoughtfully put one. And um, we spend a massive amount of time on it. In the end, banks have only two things uh, to offer, and it's money and people, or the services of their people. And so, of course, uh, we have to make sure we give uh, that time. Uh, my own experiences over many years uh, have been that the tangible issues of pay which of course have been so focused on in the banking industry, are in fact more important as reinforcers than as drivers. Uh, and uh, if you want good people uh, and you want them engaged, you first of all have to engage their heart and their head before you engage their wallet. The wallet's got a, a place to be engaged, but it's heart and head. So you have to, be, you have to explain uh, what your company is trying to do, how it's going to get there, is that credible, that's engaging uh, the head. Uh, the heart uh, means dealing with uh, values uh, and the environment in which people are operating and whether they feel that they're uh, likely to be supported and encouraged to do things uh, that they feel are right. So uh, I think these are the areas that we spend a huge amount of time on and then trying to reinforce in some of the ways I described, if you like, with at least pay structure, uh, some of those messages of what is or isn't important. Uh, and there's, an, I suppose, another thing, and, and many of you who are uh, thinking about starting out in your careers, uh, I would say this to you as well. Uh, you know, there was a period of uh, recent decades where um, banking, if you like, pulled away from many other things that you could do uh, in your career, pulled away from in a number of different ways, of, of which uh, money was one, of course. Um, I think banking can still be one of the world's uh, most stimulating and most interesting professions. It doesn't need to be seven times more stimulating and interesting in financial or other times to still, to still be something that, that attracts 
uh, really good people who really enjoy doing it. And so uh, it's, of course, difficult when you're being pulled a bit back down to earth, uh, which effectively bankers are being. Uh, but I think even uh, when uh, banking has reached earth again, uh, earth can be a pretty good place. Fourth row, gentlemen there. Gentleman in the fourth row. Hello, David, David Lewis of a company called PMI Consult, we're a banking consultancy, uh, XLSC. Um, with the RBS group of companies, the, the, clearly you had a reputational problem uh, which uh, resulted in the government <coughs> bailing you out. Um, you seem to have three brands, and at least three prominent brands that I can think of, and doesn't reputational risk damage require that you rebrand in some way, or are you keeping the brand separate because you see potential need to break up the business in some way so that Coots could be sold and NetWest could be sold. Uh, what's your thinking about rebranding uh, on this? And can I ask, would you actually, obviously you've downsized the investment bank substantially, you've pulled out of geographies that you felt were marginal to your business, uh, reduced product lines where you, they were marginal to your business, but would you actually be in favor of actually divesting the investment bank completely? Mm -hmm. uh, well, thank you for those, for those questions. I guess. Uh, the, the first way that I think about branding is that I just didn't think that it was anywhere near the top of our entry of what was important. I wanted us to change the reality, uh, and I feel that over time, reality is your best brand. <coughs> and so, uh, to my mind, if there is a case for rebranding, uh, it's when uh, you have got a reality to talk about that you've changed, uh, not an intention to change that you want to communicate. Uh, and so that, that, that I, I guess, is really my, my first issue. And, I, and, and you know, there are arguments pro, pro and against uh, doing different things with our brands. But whatever they are, I put it as, as later in the agenda to be examined more carefully. Um, I think in terms of your second question on our business mix, and, and I think I would apply this to all of our businesses, not just uh, the part that you mentioned. Are, the way I like to, to approach it is our, our base case is sort of to be industrialists. We, I don't want our base case to be as financial engineers. Uh, and so we try to think deeply about our industry and about our position in it, the strengths and weaknesses that we have and what we can become. And then we try and set a course that has a good chance of lasting and being consistent and being if you like, built brick by brick on serving customers well. Um, uh, and, uh, and so I try not to, to, to keep reaching for the piece of financial engineering, of which divestments is one example or another, um, uh, to a second guess an organic structure, uh, strategy once the restructuring piece uh, is done, which of course is a very big piece. That said, you know, uh, we're, we're salaried employees, we're owned, we're a shareholder owned company. Uh, and so uh, part of our duty to shareholders, having made sure that we're trying to operate well for customers, uh, is uh, to be dispassionate in understanding the building blocks of the value of our business. And sometimes that does lead you to inorganic uh, solutions. Uh, but, but the way around, I like to, to approach it as the one I've described. I am Julia, Julia Emiliani from Capco, a financial services um, consultancy for regulations as well. And my question is regarding to LIBOR, um, and what do you think is the main challenge in adapting with the new regulations, and do you think this will be a big change for investment banks in the UK, and especially RBS? I'm sorry, did you, were you asking about LIBOR? I didn't quite... Yes, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I think that the, in, in some ways, <coughs> the sadness on, uh, on adapting to, to a new way of, of, of setting LIBOR, and I'll come on to the behavioral bit, the sadness is that it could have been done a while ago, uh, and neither regulators nor the industry were focused on that particular index in the way that, with hindsight, should have been, because the, I think the, the, the changes put forward in the weekly review are, are very sensible ones. Uh, they, they're relatively quick to, to adopt and, and uh, uh, very much uh, in favor of them. Um, of, of course, the other enormous sadness, uh, which is then more central to the things I've been talking about tonight, is, is that, if you like, the misconduct, as, a, as opposed to the controls, the misconduct 
uh, of the individuals uh, in LIBOR uh, is bad in its own right, but bad because it is then used to reinforce people's feelings of what banks are like overall and of the issue of, if you like, self before customer, um, which sort of comes out in that. I think that that is, you know, I don't think banking is like that. All industries can have some individuals who are bad apples, but nevertheless, it caught banking in a vulnerable area in an extreme way. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, all of us who are, are um, playing a role in this industry going forward need to be extremely clear uh, about that as being a, a, a behavior that can't be tolerated. Okay. We've got a gentleman on the, the left. Yeah. yeah, all the way. The green shirt. Sorry. <clears throat> Hi. Um, so throughout your speech, you mentioned about um, making RBS a good company with customers at the forefront. Um, with Santander set to take over RBS High Street Banking, is this really caring about the customers? It looks like you're palming them off to a bank who's got a parent company with sort of volatile financial situation with high exposure to the Eurozone crisis. And as an RBS customer myself, I feel that we're not really being put at the forefront. You're not sort of thinking about our finance, our deposits. Uh, well, I have great sympathy with that remark, and I'm trying to make those arguments um, about uh, whether it was sensible <coughs> to force us to divest it to the European Commission and lost. Uh, so unfortunately, the, the, uh, the divestment, the timetable uh, was forced on us, and the available list of bidders was not long as, as other transactions uh, in that space um, uh, illustrate. That said, um, uh, and although it's not, if you like, my task to uh, do a commentary on other companies. I do think Santander uh, is a good bank. Uh, I do think that they uh, have, do many things well. Uh, like all banks, uh, there are a bunch of things they can also do better. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I, I wouldn't talk them down uh, for a moment, although I'm very sad uh, that we're being forced to part company with, with some of our customers. Stay right there with the man in the yellow shirt. Thank you. Uh, Nadir, I'm an alumni. So I've got a um, two-part question. Uh, the first thing is, um, as the CEO of RBS, what is the most important achievement or the change that you are proud of? And number two is, what's your view on the regulatory approach um, from the UK perspective as well as the global perspective to make the banks, as you put it, the gold standard? Thank you. I suppose my experience um, uh, of life in lots of different aspects has been that the minute you get proud, you get ticked, kicked in the teeth. And so it's probably better to save pride for when you've retired uh, and, uh, and just get on with making things better. So, you know, in the end, the, the job of someone in my job is to, of course, celebrate uh, the success of the people who are uh, doing things uh, for the bank, uh, but to use that celebration uh, really is a way to ask for more uh, and strive for more in the way that I, I hope I've described uh, today. Uh, I think in terms of your second question on, um, on regulation and gold standard, um, you know, the, there, there is a, a big shift in what you might call the basic minimum, which effectively is what regulation is about, ensuring that safety net uh, below which banks uh, shouldn't fall, and that big shift, you know, is is taking place in front of our eyes. Um, but I, I hope the uh, points that I've been making tonight, uh, where I haven't really referred to regulators very much at all, uh, are more apposite. That banks should be good companies uh, because that's their purpose to serve customers well and be good companies, not because someone is making them, uh, whether by regulation or otherwise, uh, and uh, therefore the best banks will be doing the things that they're doing not because there's a regulator sitting over their shoulders, but because they think those are the right things to do, whether that's around safety and soundness, or whether that's be uh, around changing uh, to serve customers well, and, and that's certainly the kind of bank that I hope we can become uh, and that we're working towards. Red, woman in red, second row. Hi, I'm Sarah Batt, Royal Bank of Scotland. I work in your PPI team. 
Um, I was just wondering, seeing as you touched upon PPI and LIBOR, and obviously there were endowments and bank charges before that, um, whilst they're not the root cause, um, what can we learn from those specific incidents that would help us address the root cause? Well, as I say, I, I mean, uh, obviously, one can go into a lot of detail, which we don't have time for here, but, but I do think that the the unifying theme, while each of these issues has got more complexity around it, the unifying theme uh, is, was your purpose about serving customers well and your success as a company derived from success in your purpose? Or was your purpose to be successful and your customers simply the vehicle for doing it? it may seem like I'm splitting hairs. I don't think I'm splitting hairs. And, uh, and so uh, I think that if you go through a number of these scandals, whatever you might want to call them around banking, you will see uh, that uh, beneath each of them is perhaps the order of, if you like, customer and self uh, and the way in which it was thought through. Uh, that said, uh, as I also mentioned, you know, the, the world is a complicated world that we all uh, live in and there are trade-offs that everyone has to make and every company has to make uh, and uh, it's never possible to always get those trade-offs right uh, and even if you get them right as a judgment matter there will be you know some people who don't think you have uh, and who feel uh, differently about it so that so you know I don't think we uh, can expect to achieve uh, perfection um, but we can certainly strive to do better than we have been okay let's go to the woman in black just behind you there on the Başak Yertekin, LSE. Um, my question is, how did you decide which business lines to divest and which business lines to pursue, given the deleveraging pressure and the government's um, pressure to land to certain areas of the UK economy? Um, slight hobby horse of mine that you've touched on. Well done. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I am occasionally rude about is is what I describe as business by chi pie, by pie chart. Uh, and I think that too often some people in business think, wouldn't it be nice if my business could be described by the pie chart that looks like this or a pie chart that looks like that, and then, in a sense, reverse the business strategy into the nice pie chart. Uh, and it seems to me that uh, the right way to approach this is to say, our job as businesses is to be really good at what we do and so we should limit the things that we do to the things we can be really good at. Now of course that allows for some change over time and some growth over time and so on but I think that you, you should start with trying to have a very clear-sighted view on what you are going to be good at and if you concentrate your efforts on that you're more likely to achieve it. Okay, Commander White, the third row here. White shirt. <coughs> uh, I'm Richard, I'm alumni of LSE. Um, can you share with me or us your thoughts on QE and its impact for the banking industry, and also in particular what it does to RBS? Um, well, I think that, I mean, obviously this could be a, a, a complicated subject, but Trying to, uh, trying to boil it down to how I think about it, QE is basically printing money to finance the government's deficit so that for a period of time the government can run that deficit, i.e. put more money into the economy than it takes out in taxes um, during, during an adjustment uh, period. Uh, and the alternative, if the government was not printing money to finance its deficit, uh, would be that everyone else would have to divert some part of their money to financing that deficit, uh, which uh, the worry would be would be a diversion uh, that would uh, make the adjustment faster and more uncomfortable than, than people want to achieve. Now, of course, the corollary of it, though, is that it forces interest rates low. Uh, and, you know, again, one of the perhaps ironies of uh, the situation uh, is that arguably it was excess borrowing and asset bubbles 
uh, that gave rise to the world's vulnerability and to the vulnerability in particular of those countries that, that have greater vulnerability in economic ter terms uh, and uh, the people who are being harmed by QE are the people, the savers, the prudent ones, uh, who of course are experiencing low income. That's, that's an irony of the way that the world works in terms of economic recovery um, uh, and, uh, and therefore you know, why of course it's important to be sensitive through those issues in, of public policy, though I, though I don't see the way uh, out of it. But I do think that QE represents an enrichment of our economic tools for dealing with crises uh, and uh, has allowed the very difficult, difficult political challenges of bringing people together, if you like, in, in austerity programs and, and in dealing with competitiveness. It's bought time for politicians to work through that uh, with their electorates uh, in a way that, in, if you like, in, in past points, uh, has, has been less easy to do. Man in the white t-shirt to your right. <laughs> um, I'm Jack, I'm an undergrad at LSE. Um, I was wondering, how would your approach to rebuilding RBS differ if you weren't pretty much entirely government owned? Well, I would say that the, um, the decision that was made in 2008-9 by the then government uh, was one that I think is shared by governments all around the world in relation to banks in, in general, which is that governments don't want to be long-term owners of banks. Uh, and they think governments of, of, across all political persuasions don't want to be, and they think that the really important resource allocation job that banks play in modern economies is better done in a regulated private sector. Uh, and so uh, with that, if you like, philosophical decision, which as I say is very broadly shared in different countries around the world, came the decision to leave RBS with a listing uh, and with all the legal and management duties uh, to treat all shareholders equally, uh, to apply, if you like, corporate disciplines to the way uh, that the bank was uh, being operated. Um, all of that said, the circumstances of RBS's fall from grace, the depth of that fall from grace, and the ongoing uh, reminder that everyone has of it through the shareholding, uh, I do think have forced us to do what anyway I think we should be doing, which is about openness, transparency, sensitivity to some of the issues that uh, I was talking about today, uh, and uh, thinking about, if you like, the balance of interest uh, in society and the ways that banks contribute to society uh, through doing their job well uh, and the different areas that I've talked about earlier on. Okay, man in the gray suit on the aisle. <coughs> Hi, uh, Colin Walsh, uh, another World Bank of Scotland employee. Um, so it's not going to be a difficult question. You, you brought out the home team here. This is <laughs> um, a key theme of your speech seems to be uh, the need to push through a pretty radical program of cultural change. But uh, with the Universal Bank, of course, you're starting with two very different cultures to begin with, uh, the retail banking side and the investment banking side. And I guess my question is, what similarities and differences do you see in terms of that program of change? Well, you know, um, there, are, there are differences between people and cultures uh, everywhere you look. You don't have to just look at that particular division within banks. You know, I can go to any branch we have anywhere in the country and find you uh, 10 completely different people who happen to be working together, often coming from different cultures themselves with different strengths and weaknesses and things that motivate them. Uh, and um, uh, we can see that geographically uh, as well around the world, even within the UK. And so, <coughs> in that sense, <clears throat> you know, I think that there are, if you like, some basic hygiene factors which can apply to everything you're trying to do across different geographies and cultures and job grades and so on. Um, but part of, I think, good culture in a company is to get to the point where you don't, you're not a control freak. Uh, and where you uh, part of your job is to empower your people with an agreed framework to develop in the way that that they will 
drive best because they're closest to what's needed to their to their customers. Uh, and so I don't aspire to have a single culture across RBS. I don't think it would be valuable, but I do aspire uh, to have some consistent what I call hygiene factors, uh, which are strong and embedded, uh, and the like of which I've been talking about uh, this evening. Okay. And the grey suit, red tie, very new. Thank you. Uh, Kumar David Arson, Grant Thornton, and ex LSE. Uh, the question I have is that um, regulatory arbitrage was a catalyst in the financial crisis emanating from Basel II not being adopted in the States. Uh, we now have Basel III, which is not being properly, or in the key points, being adapted in the States. How would that, do you think, would be adverse to rebuilding banking, and what do you think we could do? Maybe I would just go back to, to my answer of a few minutes ago, uh, which is that, you know, that there's a sense in which any rule that you put up uh, can be um, used as a goal uh, and therefore can be subject to arbitrage. Uh, and we don't need to just look at banking, we can think of all sorts of rules throughout society. Uh, and it's for that reason that certainly, if you like, the disciplines of being a really good company, in our case being a really good bank, uh, I don't think should emanate from rules. They should emanate from values and what I would think of as timeless disciplines provided, of course, that's compliant with the rules. Uh, and, and so I think that's, uh, you know, rules adapt over time. They try and spot the obvious things that went wrong. They have varying degrees of success. Uh, but I think we should all be aiming for a, a higher standard than simply uh, observance of the rules. Other questions? There's a woman in black, the two rows in front of you. There you are. Thanks. Um, do you think RBS could have been turned around faster if it didn't have to um, shrink its balance sheet at such scale in the economic downturn? And when do you think RBS will be ready to pay back the government loan? Thank you. Um, well, I think that we were triangulating a number of different things that were important and we've tried to go as fast as we thought was humanly consistent with the different things that were important. <coughs> um, some of the, re a lot of the restructuring, in fact, all of the restructuring had an industrial and strategic thought to it. It also had a series of financial, if you like, ob objectives uh, to it, uh, and then it had the essential managerial objective and the way we went about it was to try to separate the bad that we needed to get rid of with the ongoing or the good or the what we thought we could make good and so the vast majority of our people were left free to improve the bank in its ongoing operations whilst a smaller group of people were if you like carrying out the stuff that needed to be carried out and, and so that's why as an example in our ongoing uh, UK retail and commercial businesses, we actually increased lending in the last three years whilst the company as a whole was massively reducing its balance sheet because we tried to uh, not be all things to all people but actually to focus on what was really important uh, to us going forward and the things that were less important. So it's, you know, you never know in life whether you could have gone faster or slower, you, you know, you, 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 because you, you would, none of us can know for certain the counterfactual. Um, but we have tried to go as fast as we possibly can, consistent with not dropping the ball. And I'm sure we've done an imperfect job, but we've done the best we could. In the very back, there's a man. Uh, George Hay, Reuters Breaking News. Um, just wondered, uh, two questions. Do you agree with Andrew Haldane that banking regulation is too complicated and should be made simpler? And secondly, um, Peter Cummings recently received a £500,000 fine from the uh, FSA for his role in the, part, in the collapse of HBOS. Do you find it strange that no one at RBS um, got a similar fine? 
you're going to hang me on being open and transparent now, aren't you? But um, <laughs> let's see. I think that um, there's a challenge, of course, in when we talk about regulation, because whenever systems of regulation have been too simple, they've failed. Uh, but it's also fair to say that complexity can bring with it its own challenges. Uh, and, you know, the pendulum is likely to swing between both in, all, in many walks of life. Uh, and again, that's really why the whole theme of what I've been talking about uh, tonight uh, is uh, to try to move away from a world where you simply do what you're regulated to do into a world where you try and be a really good company within the rules. Um, <coughs> so I think that's how I would think about it. In terms of your second, obviously, I, you know, it would, it, it's not right for me to talk about individuals, but you know, what I'm very clear about is that uh, there should be transparent, fair, and evenly applied rules across society. Uh, and I don't think bankers should have special treatment, uh, whether good or bad. Um, uh, uh, and, uh, and that's, you know, I think what we would all seek for. Man in dark suit, pink shirt. Hi, my name is Joris Eikenal, I'm from the LSC. I have a question related to the previous question and your answer too about regulation and the banking. Is it that um, after the economic crisis, a barrage of regulation, and now it's coming more and more also from the European Union, do you see the European Union regulation as beneficial or more or less a barrier towards your vision of, of restructuring of banking system? Another question is, um, the Federal Reserve regulators has, have been saying increasingly that London is being seen as somehow of a liability towards the banking as it's, um, as because more is allowed here than as it is overseas. If, for example, you could see the London will with the JP Morgan uh, um, case. Do you agree with that or do you disagree with that? Um, on, on your first subject, I, I guess not just in, in banking regulation, but, in, but again across society, we constantly wrestle with the pros and cons of uniformity in level playing fields, uh, with speed and nimbleness, and being able to adapt conditions to suit uh, the, the, you know, the topic at hand. Uh, we do that with world trade. Um, uh, legislation. We do that with patents and, uh, and, and trademarks uh, around the world. We do it with lots of things. And, and of course, there isn't a single correct answer to it. So, personally, I think that, if you like, for the commanding heights of the rules around financial services to be as uniform as possible around the world, whether within the European Union or more broadly, is desirable. Um, but uh, if, if you take that too far, you come up with a system that's too sclerotic and takes too long to change and where individual countries can't take account of their own, if you like, democratic priorities from time to time and it's, it's trying to reach that balance. On the subject of London, I, I mean, I, I've been a banker obviously for quite a few decades, albeit um, uh, out of the industry for a, for a, a part of the, uh, the last decade. And my observation, I've dealt with pretty much every regulator of a, in major countries around the world, is I think that the UK regulators uh, have probably been, over that period of time, the best, the most competent, the most sophisticated in, in terms of my impressions of them. Um, uh, and that, that doesn't mean to say they were flawless, not, none of us are flawless. <coughs> but I think what has, if you like, uh, made these comments about London come to the fore is that London was unlike many other financial centres, that it was an off essentially an offshore financial centre. In other words, the UK is quite a small hinterland for London relative to, for example, the US to New York or Germany to Frankfurt. Um, and so uh, the greatest explosion of scale and innovation in financial services was cross-border financial services over the last 20 years. To incredible benefit of the world in the process of globalization, but also where the excesses uh, in part appeared. And I think that that, if you like, London's geographic role showed up some more of that uh, rather than its regulatory, rather than its regulatory circumstance. And of course, uh, we also uh, need to look back at what actually triggered uh, the financial crisis specifically, which was, uh, uh, of course, you know, the U.S. Uh, um, securitized products market. 
Let's go down to the front. There, a woman in the second row. Um, Francis Revel, Hall and Partners, brand research agency. Um, you spoke very eloquently about customer service and customer satisfaction um, being kind of at the heart of, of what RBS wants to do. But realistically, the brands that currently over-index on these types of things are actually the anti-banks, so co-op nationwide, kind of niche, niche players in the market. Without a drastic rebrand of RBS, which levers do you think that you can pull with the existing brand in order to tackle those threats? Well, <coughs> I mean, I think that I, I might just slightly hijack your point uh, for a second because a lot is talked about competition. And, and I, I really believe in competition. I think it's very important. I think it's one of the, one of the things that forces people to change and improve. Um, but competition isn't, doesn't really come from a bunch of people trying to do exactly the same thing in the same way. Uh, competition is much more effective when you have some people coming at a problem sideways on. Sometimes they fail, sometimes they succeed. Uh, and so actually, I think it is much more likely that banking markets stay competitive if there are some people coming at it sideways on as challenger brands or just using the internet or whatever it would be than if you create a bunch more look-alikes of what we've got already. Um, uh, and so, uh, uh, and, and, you know, we also have to understand that like some other industries, banking is not only mature, but it has no patents. Uh, and everyone can copy everyone. And so often the greatest complement to competition is not the, not the bank that came up with, the, with a different approach, um, eating everyone else's lunch. It's everyone else saying, oh, I better come up with that same approach as well, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and flattering the innovation, but keeping the status quo. But just because the status quo was kept, didn't mean competition didn't work. It actually meant that everyone else was forced to change in order to avoid uh, competition damaging them. So that, that I, I sort of like to hijack it in that, in that way. But again, RBS, the story of RBS gives some support to a point that I made earlier in relation to branding. You know, it's quite hard to come up with a company whose brand has had greater kicking for entirely legitimate reasons than RBS. And yet, throughout the crisis, not a single one of our ongoing businesses has lost customers in any statistically meaningful way. Um, maybe that's because competition doesn't work and so on and so forth, but I, you know, there are plenty of other banks that haven't been, uh, haven't been as kicked. Uh, and so my analysis of it is that, yes, if you ask a focus group to rank brands, we will rank lowly. But if you then uh, ask people who experience us whether most of our people most of the time are doing things to their satisfaction, the answer is a better one. It's not as good as we want it to be, but it's a better one. And so again, I come back to, to my mind, I want to fix the reality, and that should be our brand, not the other way around. Got a question right there on the first row. Uh, hi, my name is Andrew Wood. I'm a civil servant. Um, uh, you talked a bit about um, how you wanted to do more of the things that you think RBS is good at. I'm trying to get an idea of kind of tangibly what, what you think those things are. So let's say you, um, you started without a bank. You didn't start with RBS. Let's say you started at zero and you were building a bank. What kind of bank would you, would you build? Would it, be, you know, would it be universal? What, what kind of business lines would it have? Um, I suppose I haven't um, indulged in that, <laughs> in the sense that I, I haven't really had the luxury to indulge. You know, we, we had a set of cards and we had to play, uh, and I don't think it was open to us to say, sorry, we don't like these, give us another set. Um, uh, uh, but I also believe that it's undesirable for the world or any country in any industry to have a bunch of lookalikes. Uh, and to have everyone saying, well, there's only one way to do this. I think it's desirable to have different people have a crack at it in, in different ways. Uh, but, you know, I'll, I'll pick you some negative examples because, in a sense, my job was, was really to winnow down to what we were going to do. Uh, um, let's take India. We were the fifth biggest retail bank in India. Uh, and expansion in, in, in Asia was one of the pieces of rationale behind the ABN AMRO acquisition. So that sounded great. India, wonderful country, you know, big emerging market, 
uh, huge economic power for the future, why wouldn't, why wouldn't that be wonderful? Why would you not want to keep it? Well, it turned out that being the fifth biggest foreign bank meant having 30 branches when the Indian banks that were market leaders would have 3,000 branches. And I just didn't see, uh, and, and actually some of the technologies of banking, mobile banking, are done as well in India by Indian banks as they are in Britain, maybe better, by British banks. So it was far from clear to me why it would, why the Indian market needed us, and even if it did, how we got from A to B credibly relative to uh, doing other things we could do. So it's just trying to work through, sometimes it's a geographic dimension, sometimes it's a product dimension and so on. Okay, I think the very last question will go to Amanda Grace Sweater. <coughs> ahead of you. Hello there, Steve Todd, CGFT, a consultancy. <clears throat> I'm just interested, uh, you're talking about customer service, customer value. Uh, these are sort of hard things to measure, quite intangible. So practically on a data basis, how do you sort of measure whether you're truly embedding this in the business? It's a sort of the action versus words kind of debate. Thank you. It, it, that's a really good point, and it's a very live debate at the moment um, as we try and you know, move on and strengthen, um, uh, if you like, the realities behind what I've been saying tonight. Uh, and my suspicion is that it's a bit like some of the points I was making earlier on in my talk, which is the danger is if you target a single measure, people aim for the measure, they aim for the symptom rather than the truth underneath it. Uh, and so, you know, there are a series of measures like um, a net promoter score is one used a lot in, in, in consumer companies. Um, uh, other, there are all sorts of surveys on customer satisfaction and then uh, there's all sorts of if you like measures you might set up yourself like queue waiting time or number of errors per, uh, per million or whatever uh, uh, the, the Six Sigma people would tell you um, uh, and it seems to me the best way you can do it is to deploy all of the measures you can think of as part of <coughs> the picture you build up about how you're doing, but to avoid elevating any of them to a single point of religion that then fails because, if you like, it becomes a target in itself rather than a measurement of what you're trying to do. Uh, and uh, what you're actually trying to do, uh, I think if you get right, will come through those measures um, uh, by thinking by being close to your customers, understanding what they want, and then understanding what elements of that you can fulfill, because of course we can't all fulfill all of it. So uh, at the moment we're, you know, we're looking at the measures and saying, are there some different measures or more measures or less measures, and <coughs> everything in life you need some sort of measures, so we'll keep evolving that, but that, that's my feeling about it. Stephen, thank you very much. And let me ask everyone to join in thanking you, including by letting you leave the room without rushing towards you. Thank you, Steve.